<laughs> All right, how are you guys, uh, how are you guys doing? For those that are shopping, we encourage you to shop, but if you want to take a few minutes and have a break, my name is John Justice, I'm Twin Cities News Talk AM 1130 and 1035 FM, one of the hosts on Justice and Drew, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 a.m. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. We have some amazing people up here for the panel. We're about to get underway. The plan is we're gonna single-handedly solve the problem of public education in the next 40 minutes to an hour. No pressure, right? All right, so if you guys wanna come and join us, uh, feel, uh, feel free. Uh, joining us here today, up on the stage, we have uh, Senator Rich Drayheim. How you doing, sir? All right, we have Senator Eric Pratt. Representative uh, Jennifer Loon. Are also, and also Representative Sandra Erickson. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming out. I'm glad that I made it. I circled the whole facility for an hour and a half, three different times, before I finally did what I try not to do, and I name dropped, and I haggled my way into a lot. I'm just being honest. That's exactly what happened. So let's start here. We had a, um, and I'm just going to sit down here, since this young gentleman, I'm totally fine that you took my seat, but I'm going to ask you some questions, so don't, don't, uh, don't think you're getting out of it. So we had a, we had a really interesting discussion on the, on the air today. We do our Friday roundtable. And there were several stories this week, and if any of you guys want to expand on the, uh, the recent report that came out about essentially how bad the schools are failing here in in St. Paul and in, uh, in, in Minneapolis and just on the, on the state as a whole. And one thing that really stuck out was, Representative Nick Zerwas was in studio with us this morning and we got on the topic, of course, of school choice. And that seems to be the, that seems to be the go-to. Let's start off with school choice. Let's give parents the chance to decide where their kids are gonna go and be educated. And one of the things that Nick mentioned, and if I get it wrong, my apologies to Nick if he watches this later, but you know, he was talking about if you do that, those underperforming schools essentially are going to have to either shape up or they're going to fail. And we kind of on the round table all agreed that the, op the, the odds of that happening are slim to nil. And it really sounded like we were having a conversation about dealing with public education by chipping away at the edges. So let's start off here with a real easy one, right? Okay, and each of you guys can answer. You can do, and it can be the same thing. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if any of you guys repeat each other, that's fine. But if you could, could single-handedly do one thing, and you knew you could do it, to go and help public education in Minnesota, what would that one thing, what would that one thing be? Wow, that's a, that's a really big question. Um, you know, when I, when I think about um, where we're at in education, I don't know that it could really be a silver bullet, one thing type of, of uh, response. Um, one of the things I do like, and I do support public education, I served on the Prior Lake School Board for 12 years. And we had school choice and we had competition. Um, we have, uh, we've, we've got a, a, some parochial schools in town, a charter school in town. And when the charter school opened up, the administration at our school district was really worried that we were gonna lose 200, 300 kids to the school and oh my gosh. Well, my response was let's compete. We have ideas on the table, we just need to get them implemented. But what we see in education is the status quo is so embedded. It's so hard to move. Whether it's the teachers union, mm -hmm. whether it's administration. We, I wanted to start uh, STEM programs in every school. And I remember the uh, curriculum director came to me and he said, well, are you looking at a magnet school? How do you want to implement this? I said, no, every kid, every school. He looked at me and he said, nobody's done that. <laughs> I said, well, congratulations, you'll be the first. That's what we need in education. We need to start doing some, we need to let our schools start to innovate. Uh, Shakopee just started a, a program called the Academies of Shakopee, which is allowing kids to, t to start to explore their career interests uh, in high school. And it's tied in with the Ford Next Gen Learning Committee. You've got Prior Lake doing uh, uh, STEM at every level of education. We've got some really, really great ideas out there that we just have to allow our schools to take on. With Minneapolis St. St. Paul, I think we have a little bit different problem, and that is one, we've got kids stuck into a failing system where I think school choice becomes an option. Two, quite honestly, when you talk about the status quo being a tough place to move, 
Minneapolis and St. Paul school districts are these big behemoths that don't move very, that aren't very agile. And so, quite honestly, I think we need to look and start breaking up those school mm. districts uh, into smaller school districts that are more responsive to their parents. Before you, a like, quick question on that. Go ahead and, 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 hand, and hand the mic over, and you guys can, uh, can, can add to that. But just to that, what does that take? Where, where does that, where does breaking up of a school district and shrinking it down, where, where does that, where does that start? Well, you know, to, to start with the first question sure. you, you, you posed and uh, move into that one, um, you know, there, Eric is absolutely correct. There is no one single thing that will make sure that every child in Minnesota gets the education that they deserve and that the, the possibilities for every child is, is virtually unlimited because they get an excellent education. But I think what we could embrace is an overall philosophy that children are the most important consideration in anything we do in education. And that is not always the case right now. The interests of adults and of systems um, tend to override what is best for kids in education. And, and that's a real uh, unfortunate reality of, of our system right now. We, we've got some really good schools in Minnesota and we have a lot of children that do very well in our public schools. My kids both went to public school, they're doing great. Um, but that's not true for every child in Minnesota, and I know that Minnesotans all value education. It's in our state's constitution. So I think when we look at education policies and we think about that uh, mandate and the requirement in the constitution, it is to think about why it's there. It's not to just to preserve a system of public schools. It's because it's important to our citizenry and the continuation of our society and our economy that every person be educated. And how do we do that? Not every kid learns the same way. Not every school setting is appropriate for every child. They're all unique. I, I said anybody who's got more than one kid knows that they're very different. I have two children and they're completely opposite As learning styles, um, personalities, you name it, even though, you know, same parents, same uh, background and being raised. So um, we need to provide more opportunities and more uh, ability of parents to make those choices for their kids that is the best learning environment. Because um, just sustaining a system uh, with public dollars uh, is not enough. That is not meeting the mandate of educating the public. So, and I would say with regards to breaking up some of those of the very large school systems, particularly in our inner cities that have not been doing well and been failing a lot of our kids for a long time, uh, we have looked at that before in the legislature. We, we actually, back in the 2011-12 session, had a proposal to turn the schools over to control of the cities. Uh, so to the mayor of Minneapolis or mayor of St. Paul. Oh. And I do think that those uh, public leaders should bear a bigger responsibility mm -hmm. for making sure that the school systems within their cities are doing the job. And uh, I would really hope that they'll become more engaged in that. Well, my district's a little different, um, you know, very rural. And uh, for school choice, it's... It, there's not a lot of options in, in rural Minnesota. Um, but I, I think, to me, the main um, issue we have to look at is leadership. And the whole idea that we can funnel all the kids through the same funnel and expect the same outcome. So we, we really need to uh, bring the focus back to the classroom, give the freedom to the teachers, maybe quit labeling everybody, and, and, and really just focus on the individual and uh, you know, be compassionate and understanding that everybody learns at a different pace and uh, you know, try to find a place for them in society no matter who or what they are. Well, I agree with everything that's been said so far, uh, in addition to the fact that we have a lot of school choice within the public system in Minnesota, so parents do have opportunities uh, if they are aware of them. But I think that one thing that is important is to put more accountability on the district and school levels. That uh, we have a world's best workforce, we have not repealed it, it is our state accountability system, and then we now have a federal accountability system, which we had before in No Child Left Behind, now we have it Every Student Succeeds Act. And we tried this session to embed uh, the federal into the state so our school districts would have one accountability system. 
Uh, that's where the uh, responsibility has to lie, within the district and within each school in the district. And there has to be some kind of way for us to hold them accountable uh, in a variety of ways, but it has to be decided by them. And that's why the world's best workforce exists. But it doesn't seem that it's become very important because one provision in it was that the commissioner could use up to 2% of general funding to redirect a school or a school district if they weren't meeting those uh, points that were set out in the world's best workforce. The accountability aspect, well, let me go, let, 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 let me go this route. There almost seems to be a, a, a level of, and this is going to sound horrible, but there, there seems to be almost a need to have a, a, a level of acceptance that you're not, it's not always going to be successful. You know, uh, it, 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 as you said, uh, not every kid is going to learn the same and not every kid is going to be able to achieve. We're looking at a, we're looking at doing the best job that we can and finding, for lack of a better term, an acceptable level where we go, okay, we're succeeding the best that we can succeed. It seems as if we can't even hit that mark. And so much of it comes down to, and I think you may have mentioned it, the leadership of the individual schools. I mean, when you begin, like if you talk about school safety, something that's obviously been, been discussed a lot, I, I firmly believe that when you talk about school safety, it's best tackled at that school. Not even the district level, I'm talking at that school. What is going to serve that school's needs in terms of, of safety? Because it's not gonna be the same for your rural area as it is for any of your districts. So when we're looking at the quality of education, how do we get, and this is what I'm driving at, how do we get the communities more involved to put importance on those local elections, to elect better leadership, that can enact the necessary change across the board. Because when you look at the priorities of our elections, I dare say that when you start trickling down from you know, state, local, representative, senate, and then you get down to city council members, when you get down to school boards, what percentage of communities are paying attention to school boards? And unfortunately, you end up with a lot of agenda-driven individuals that are you know, push, put into positions of power in these schools. So that's a really long-winded way to say, how do we get the community better engaged to enact and to put in place better leadership at the local level to affect the change in the schools themselves? Well, I'll take that one first, but I want to pass it to Senator Pratt, too, who served on a school board. Uh, you know, parents have to be educated as well as their children. <laughs> so it is, it is a responsibility in part of legislators to do that when we hold our town halls, but also to go out and recruit uh, those in our community that we know understand the situation, make sure we have educated school board members or recruits or candidates, uh, be, because there's so little known actually at the school board level about really what it takes to hold a school or a district accountable. Right. They, they just don't know what that is. They, they like their school and that's what it's about. And so, you know, they don't worry about another school or another district as long as their children come home and they love school sure. or they speak highly of it. So there's, there's an education process that needs to take place. And I think as time goes on, I think we are getting more more of our constituency educated on like funding uh, and policies, uh, di dictates that come down from either the Department of Ed uh, at the state level or, or the federal level, and some of those are pretty onerous and parents are paying attention. But let's hear from Senator Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, she always puts me on the spot. Um, you know, it, it's... Something it, tells me you're not short on words on this subject. Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I think one of the problems that we've had is, and it's, and it's honestly been a move over the last 10 years. When I first ran for the school board, I ran in an odd year. We just had an election every year. Local elections, city council, school board were on the odd years. Congress, the governor, uh, state officials were on the even years. Well, we didn't have voter turnout, and now we put them on the even years. And quite honestly, these local issues get lost in the mix. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to see us, and I don't know if we do it legislatively, but I'd like to see us get these local elections back on the odd years. I don't think it's that tough to expect to know every, uh, every first Tuesday in, in, in November that I'm going to go to the polls, and it doesn't matter whether it's 2017, 2018, 2019, but we've got to get a focus 
uh, on these local elections. Most of the school board members I've, ma I've met, um, they run for the right reasons. They care about kids. I mean, when you think about education, it's pretty easy. You focus on student achievement, you want great teachers in the classroom, you want stable, reliable funding, and you want your parents and community engaged. That's, yeah. that's the secret sauce. And so when I was on the board, we had a million dollar deficit. Um, when I left, we had a $3 million surplus. Through that time, our, school, our scores went up because we focused on student achievement. We focused on having great teachers in the classroom. We focused on having the right leadership in the district and sometimes pushing them beyond their comfort level. But I think the biggest thing we could do is get these local elections back on odd years. Well, and I think too, and, and, and before, you, uh, before you respond, I think you're really onto something because I think we can all agree there are plenty of individuals who are active in the, in, in the election process that I'm sure would be more than happy to get involved in off years to try to support and put better leadership in place at the school board level if we ended up having that change. Right, and you know, that's kind of one of the big debates that has gone on at the legislature because I know my, my own school district has had off year elections for school board members and they are now moving to an on election year schedule because it saves them a lot of money. Mm. Otherwise, the school district has to pay for those individual okay. elections. So just to, to play a little devil's advocate and give you the other side of that coin. But, sure. Uh, I, think, um, I think we can do a better job, and maybe the legislature can help, in helping the public and parents understand what an important position school board is. And, I mean, these are, uh, in, in my particular case, I represent Eden Prairie. Eden Prairie School District is the only one in my area that I uh, have as a constituency uh, their annual budget's over a hundred million dollars. That is a lot of responsibility. Uh, we have, you know, well over uh, 9,500 students. So um, that is a big responsibility and, and a big elected office. And people need to understand that. The other thing people need to know is, as uh, Representative Erickson mentioned, there's a lot of mandates that come from the state and the federal government, and, and we need to work more to reduce some of those. But there is also a lot of ability to affect change. Like, certain things, uh, I'll get emails and calls from parents complaining about a particular curriculum. The state does not mandate curriculums that schools use. That is all local choice. Oh. And parents have a great deal of influence over their local school boards and, and what is done. So people need to know that they can and should exercise uh, their right to express their opinion to their school boards because that is really, I think, one of the best ways to make change. Senator Dreheim, how um, how engaged are your uh, are your, your your rural schools in their in their local elections in their local uh, school board elections? You know, I, th I think probably more than the bigger cities, and um, you know, my kids go to a, a Cleveland high school. Uh, you know, 540 kids probably this year. Um, that's preschool through 12th grade in one building. Uh, you know, the parents know all the staff. Uh, most of the staff has ties to the community. I, I, I think the parent participation in all aspects of the school, there's a lot of fundraisers and whatnot because we don't have any money because there's no tax base for the school district that my kids go to. Um, so I, I think the, the involvement of the, of the community is higher in, in the smaller schools, and they probably take a little more pride than in the bigger towns, and that just goes to the point that every school district, every community is a little different, and as a state, and as leadership, we have to be um, aware that one size doesn't fit all. You know, it's, it's tough because as a, as a talk show host, I mean, we obviously see it happen firsthand. When you have tragedies like we've seen and the topic of school safety comes up and suddenly we're talking all about school safety, I'm not going to lie, it's hard because... Having two kids, I have an 11 and 16 year old. I know darn well that by and large, my kids are probably gonna be safe. School safety is important, don't misunderstand. But the likelihood of a, of a, of a horrible event happening is, is, is very small, is very small. Using events like what happened in Parkland too to push for, for, for school safety, I, I don't necessarily agree with because that was a systemic failure starting with that individual kid who was crying out for help and from day one didn't get any help and it was just failure after failure after failure. That had very little to do with the safety of the school and everything to do with all the failures that, that brought it to that. 
The point I'm trying to make is, though, talking about education by and large, even on a talk show, it's not flashy, right? You know, for those that don't have kids, kind of like, oh, what does it matter and all that, right? So it's frustrating when the, 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 the bulk of the conversation gets dominated when it comes to education around things like school safety when we all know on a day-to-day -day basis there is a litany of things that we need to be addressing beyond, beyond school safety. Are we making progress, do you think? I know that study that came out doesn't look like we are, but you, you all have a much better history than I do. I've been here two, only two and a half years now, and I'm wondering, do you feel like we're making progress? Have we taken a step back? And whoever wants to, to start off on that, uh, please feel free. And, and, and depending on what your answer is, either way, if we're, if we're making progress, how are we making progress? And if we're not making progress, what's been holding us back? Well, in the study that came out, and I think you're talking about whether or not we're, kids are meeting proficiency in right. our standards. So we set standards at the state level for uh, what kids should be able to know and to demonstrate in reading and in math and some in science. And so, um, no, I mean, those studies uh, that just came out show that basically our test scores, and this is on the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessments that kids take every year from third grade through eighth grade and, and take... Uh, uh, once in high school, one in reading, one in science, one in math throughout the four years. Um, we're at a, about a 68 and 69 percent level proficiency overall. Now when I was in school a long time ago, that was still a D. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> we are not cutting the mustard in terms of... But we're giving away participation awards now. Yes, and, <laughs> and what, is, what has been very frustrating for me is that uh, for the last few years, you know, we, we've had calls for more funding, and we've done more funding, and, and I will say, as a strong supporter of public schools and somebody who has kids, if you have kids, you know they are not inexpensive, right? It's going to take some money to educate children. But we ought to be getting better results for the money that we're investing because we have been increasing our financial support for schools. We do provide more funding for kids who bring uh, perhaps additional challenges with them. So for children who are uh, from families that are, are poor, uh, and we, the standard is free or reduced price lunch, if your family qualifies for that, schools get a lot more money for each of those children that come into their school districts to try to help them overcome some of those challenges that they may have. And we've done that for a long time. We're recognized as one of the best states in the country for doing that. But it's not getting us anywhere. It's not showing better results. So I think we really need to do something to disrupt sort of the status quo in the system. Again, that comes to giving parents more choices and more accountability. I think it also comes to freeing teachers and recognizing them for the professionals they are. Stop dictating to teachers how they have to do everything. Turn their creativity loose so they can, you know, I don't care how you get there, just make sure that the kids in your classroom are learning how to read and how to do the math and, and the science and the standards that we want them to learn. How you get there is why we have professionals in the classroom. And so we're, uh, there's too much being done to kind of tamp that down and everybody's got to be on the same program uh, from building to building and that I have less concern about that than let's see what kind of results we can get. Thank you. Um, you know, besides the reading and math, I, I think one of the main things that we're missing um, is the common sense problem solving. Mm -hmm. And we used to have all these hands-on type courses, industrial arts, whatever you want to call them, whatever nomenclature you want to use. We've, we've cut a lot of that away, and I think we need to bring that back because those type, you know, even if you didn't like shop class or whatever, you, you at least had to think and reason uh, conceptually a little bit more than just looking at a book or a notepad. Yeah. Are we making, I know that, uh, I know that uh, Representative Jason Lewis has been working in that regard to, to bring back that, to, you know, to, to bring back the idea of you don't have to go to college. <laughs> you know, there are plenty, especially now in the market, I don't know if you guys heard the GDP 4.2, they revised it, you know, go Trump. Um, we're in a friendly place. Go Trump. Um, so, so I know we're making so we're, we're making some progress there, but it does it does feel like the the unions still have such a stranglehold. Thankfully, with the, with the Janus ruling, you know the teachers are going to be able to make the choices that they can make on wh whether or not they want to be you know in, involved uh, involved in that. I just wanted to comment. I'm sure you wanted to mention you wanted to, to you know, add your thoughts to what they were saying, but I wanted to to kind of jump in there real quick. Well, the thing I was going to say is uh, 
I taught ages ago. I started teaching in 1963 and, uh, in, in Minnesota. And uh, what we would say, we teachers, is uh, when the State Department of Education came down with some mandate, that too shall pass. And you know, that worked well for us because they were just kind of uh, out there, but there were no mandates, as, as Representative Loon noted. There are so many mandates today uh, from the federal and the state government. It seems if you just leave them alone, and in regard to career and technical, we had great vocational programs mm -hmm. in that day. They got expensive because, of course, equipment becomes very expensive. School districts can't afford that. But we have been working, uh, certainly Senator Pratt and I, and, and Representative Loon as well, and I'm sure uh, Senator Dreheim too, on uh, relationships between schools and community colleges or tech colleges as we like to call them, and industry. So that we have these partnerships so that our students are learning under the best because that's really what's found either in the technical college or in the industry. And we have to work harder on that. But school districts are reluctant to go that direction unless we give them more money. To that, let's, let's, that's exactly where I wanted to go. Let's talk about school funding, okay? It's always the hot button, right? But what, what comes with that is the accountability aspect of it. So are we spending enough money? If we're not spending enough money, how do we go about being fiscally responsible in spending the money that is needed without having to worry too much about that money being wasted once it actually lands you know, in the bank account of every single school that ends up getting that additional funding. Um, <laughs> How much time do we have, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and, and what you have to realize is that 85% of every school's budget is taken up by t uh, salary and benefits. It's a people business. Now, you touched on Janice, and I think that's an important point because Representative Erickson and I worked very, very hard on reforming teacher licensure, trying to make the teaching profession more accept accessible, and yet what have we found? Education Minnesota and the Dayton administration appointees trying to block us in the rulemaking process right. all along, and we've, I, we've got a pretty good record in front of the administrative law judge on this of pushing them back, but at every point they're trying to make the, the, the process more and more difficult. And so I hope more teachers take advantage of their Janus rights because when you drive by Education Minnesota, they have walls, Flanagan signs all over the place. They spend way too much time in partisan politics and not enough time worrying about our students and how they're achieving. They're not even worried about their teachers and the growth of the profession. They're worried about a progressive agenda. And we need teachers to stand up and say enough, enough of this. Well, and, and, and to that, I mean, that goes back to the, to the school board members and the leadership. And if you don't have teachers that are confident enough to know that they can step out and go, what I'm witnessing is wrong without fear of reprisal, you know, then you're, you're sunk before you even, before you've even, you know, put the boat in the water. <laughs> you're, not, you're, you're, you're not making any headway, headway at all. Well, and, and I've heard from conservative teachers um, and my mom was a teacher for 40 years, that they had to pay into the union. They just, they would, they would hear the, the partisan rhetoric and they would just kind of stay away. It made for a, a, a difficult workplace because the principals and most of the teachers were, were kind of in lockstep. This gives these teachers a voice. They can vote with their paycheck. Yeah. And that's something that, that's an opportunity they've never had before. And that's where conservative teachers need to be able to stand up and take their profession back. Are we still dealing with a, um, yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> How, it, when, it comes to the, when it comes to the individual school funding, um, and you guys can educate me a little bit, I know what it was like, and again, I've been here two and a half years now, but I know what it was like in Arizona, and when you look at the, the cost of administration, it's almost like the election analogy again. Administration, and then you get all the way down here, and here's the teacher. That has to be, that has to, does that have to happen at the local level to, to deal with that disparity? I mean, when you, that's, it's, it's not to disparage, you know, your, your, your leadership at the top inside a school district, but when you're looking at a $400,000 a year salary, I am fine with anybody making a salary that's worthy of the job that they're doing. But when you're looking at that compared to what the point of contact is and what that teacher's getting paid, 
I'm sorry, there's a problem there. So how big, how big of an issue is that for, for us here in the state? Well, it's, it's an issue, and I think it's a, and, and I look at it as a local issue. When I was on the school board, we had about 3% of our budget uh, dedicated to administration. We, we intentionally kept that low. Part of the problem is, is more of the funding has moved on to the responsibility of the state, less of the funding is at the local level. And I've always thought that um, as people start paying in their property taxes, because you see it on the, on the excess levy referendums, now people are starting to understand how much school costs. And if you want that accountability, it comes from those taxpayers. The other problem we have, and I've had this conversation with my local teachers union and the state union, is that we've got an antiquated compensation system. We bring in new teachers at poverty level wages, and they subsidize high wages for the most experienced teachers. Well, you can't tell me that a third grade teacher with five years experience is doing that less of a job than somebody who's got 15 years mm -hmm. experience. And that's driving good people out of the profession. And so I think there needs to be uh, compensation change. I was hoping we would get that with QComp, but unfortunately that never, that never uh, came to fruition the way we had hoped. And so uh, I'll just, uh, for the benefit of those folks listening, do, since I chair the Finance Committee, a little bit about how we fund education in Minnesota. And the issue of making sure that we're providing equitable funding is, is a continual discussion and debate. So um, about 85% of uh, all schools' dollars comes from the state government. So 42% of your state tax dollars, 42 cents of every dollar that you send to the state of Minnesota Department of Revenue ends up in our K-12 school system. So it's the biggest segment of our state's budget. Um, the other portion comes from property taxes locally. And, uh, and that may vary a little bit depending on what the property tax wealth is of the particular area you're in. So because of that, um, and school districts may have a referendum, and we cap the total amount that you can do, but it, it can be you know, upwards of you know, $2,000 per student or a little more. Some districts can afford to do that, and some can't. Um, it just depends on your community and what your property tax base is and how the community feels about that. And then, as I mentioned before, we give extra money for every student in poverty that's in your schools. And if you have a lot of students, 67% you know, or more, that are impoverished, you get more money for what's called a concentration factor because you have so many poor children in a particular school. So all of this means we may have schools in Minnesota, or do have schools, that are getting around $10,000 a student overall, and some schools, particularly in the inner city, that are getting fifteen or fifteen and a half thousand dollars per student, okay? That's a big difference when you talk about educating kids. So we need to look at what those differences mean and is the money uh, equating to performance. I'm, again, if you look at the numbers, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Some schools that are getting towards that lower dollar amount per kids are doing really well, some are not. So. Um, I think Eric offered some great suggestions in terms of, um, you know, are, are, again, are the labor contracts and the contracts within schools working for the benefit of children? Uh, we know that in, in some schools like the Minneapolis district, it's not because they're not able to put their best, most effective teachers in the classrooms with the kids who need them the most. Because once you move up in the seniority uh, scale uh, in their system, you are able to choose the schools where you want to be placed. And in often cases, it's not the schools with the most challenging student populations. You know, for me, it's about priorities, once again. And, uh, you know, our, our, my kids' school district, um, you know, hardly any tax base on the lower end of that reimbursement from the state. Um, but yet they do great. And the building's falling apart. They finally got a referendum passed after the third try. Um, but the building doesn't matter. It's the teachers in the classroom. And then I also think classroom size plays a big part in it. Um, so, but the, the property tax issue is something that if I had that silver bullet we talked about earlier. Sure. Um, you, you know, I, I think there's a big disadvantage for some communities that don't, do not have the tax base versus these larger, maybe suburban or metro communities that do have a larger tax base and, and the kids are the ones that are, are, I don't want to see suffer but right. feel the pain a little bit on that so um, 
if I had a, if I had my silver bullet, that's one thing I would change. I'd maybe uh, pool the property taxes and, and divide them up by kid or do something different or do away with property taxes would be my first choice. But I'm rambling, but thank you. <laughs> it's too bad that we, um, when it comes to school attendance, it's too bad we can't turn every school into a little mini Minnesota State Fair, right? Holy cow, just a side note. It is unbelievable, the crowds this year. Right, the records that are being you know that that, that are being broken. I just I don't know, that just it's a it's a good thing. I, I see that as a positive sign. I think I think people are more comfortable, you know, f going out and spending time with family, knowing that the economy is doing well. And how much of um when it when it comes to education, is there any? Just on a side note, is there any? Uh, how much is the economy tied to 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 education? Is there any? Is there any correlations there to a? I mean, obviously the tax base in terms of, in terms of money and funding, um, but is there anything else to that? That's kind of a random one, but I'll toss it out there since I threw everybody for a loop. Well, we need an educated population, so I yeah. think there's a direct relationship mm. between the economy and education. Uh, we often get uh, compared to uh, other nations. Uh, which do uh, exceed us on test scores. But one thing we have in our students is a uh, very balanced uh, a variety of interests that they pursue. And, you know, I, I think we have to be uh, looking at the great products that we do uh, see come out of our schools, charter and districts, private and uh, homeschool, because. Uh, in America, based on our uh, our freedoms, uh, children can pursue whatever they want. Right. And as long as the teacher can discover how to, you know, kind of navigate that talent or that special interest, because believe me, teaching is a very tough job, and every teacher uh, will will tell you that because. Our jobs as teachers is to discover what, what is unique about each individual in our classroom. And that takes a lot of time and, and preparation. The, the, the parents, like my wife. And, and the parents, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's Thankfully, right. Thankfully, she's heavily we, involved. We Much to too. the teacher's <laughs> chagrin, I'm sure. But, but uh, I think there's a direct correlation, and uh, I'll pass it to Representative Lute. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I think there is an impact. I mean, we see it for, again, just looking across, we talked about um, proficiency and achievement. I mean, that dividing line, and, and we, we look at different ethnic groups of students, but it really has to do more with poverty, frankly. Um, and so kids in poverty have more challenges, those families have more challenges, and and those things affect a family dynamic, and, and also and, and kids bring that with them to school. Um, and so there's more challenges there. So as the economy gets better and maybe a family's financial status gets better or maybe their housing becomes more stable or, or something of that nature, kids do do better uh, with that. But again, um, I think what, what we're still seeing is um, we've got a lot of jobs open in industries and um, positions and workplaces around the state of Minnesota. And so we have a lot of workforce shortages uh, and so we need to make sure that we're, we're uh, aware of that, that we're in communication with, with business leaders in the business community to know where those openings are, and that we're turning kids on to those opportunities that may be in an area where they're interested in. Not every kid wants to go to a four-year college. Right. Uh, that is not the pathway for every child. And so some kids are just great with working with their hands, and that's what they want to do. And we need to make sure that... Uh, our counselors and our teachers and that are able to help say, you know, I've noticed you're really good at this. Or, is this something of interest to you? And making sure that they're aware of those possibilities because otherwise we're kind of, if, if, if we think every high school is sort of a college prep, um, a lot of kids are then not being given some help that may really help them be successful in finding a, a career that doesn't require four year that they, that they love, they can support themselves and a family and our economy needs those. So to the point of uh, workforce, workforce development, um, we, we've tried real hard to get uh, more trades into the schools mm -hmm. to just talk like career days, et cetera, to say, hey, you know, this is an option. You know, if you're, if you don't, you're not sure what you want to do after college, why, why don't you try this out? You can always go back to college, et cetera. Um, but it, when, when I'm visiting with them, I had a bill on... Uh, that dealt with that this year. And, and what I heard from the, the trade groups was that they have a hard time getting into the high schools. Mm -hmm. So there's resistance 
an administration at the local schools to let in non-college type entities to talk about different career paths. And I think we have to change that. You know, we get into housing. You know, we need people to build the houses. There's a shortage. You can uh, earn a very good livable wage um, in, in the trades. Uh, a lot of times a lot higher than a college graduate. Let's, uh, let's land here on, uh, and, and in terms of our discussion and talk about families. You know, we talk about sort of the starting point. And the starting point really is when that kid walks out the door, you know, what's happening inside the home. I'm incredible. This is not me going to bragging camp. It's going to sound like it is. Okay, but it's, but, but, but it's not. Um, I'm incredibly blessed to be able to have my, my wife be a stay-at-home mom. I have an 11 and 16 year old and they are, they're both straight A students. They're only straight A students. If it was me, there's no way I'm God's green earth, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm a product of Christian education and I, I barely made it through. My wife spends countless hours with them, one-on-one. -on -one. It's a, she's the supplement to the public education, but I also understand not every child has that. And that's not to, disparage any parent that can't do that, right? It's just we're incredibly blessed to have that. But I know the amount of effort that she puts in at home for my sons to achieve what they're achieving at school, but not every family can do that. So what do we do? Can we do anything about that? We obviously can't get into the home. <laughs> we obviously, you know, we can't get in the faces of parents and care more about education, right? But are there things that we can do um, to encourage parents to put that focus on education with their kids, you know, how, how do we facilitate that? Uh, yes, and I think it, it, every parent wants their child to be successful. Parents love their kids. They, they want that regardless of, of whatever challenges they're going sure. else they're facing. So I think, you know, we need to make sure we give parents that credit because, uh, you know, um, some families are just in a, in a bad situation, but parents want their kids to succeed. But there are other pressures that uh, help that. I think, you know, whatever schools can do, um, you know, I, we're, we're, we're soon in the throes of back to school night and coming to find out what's going on in your classrooms. Well, if parents work nights or they uh, have a work schedule where they can't be there, um, I, I think that's difficult. So if we can encourage schools to have those at various opportunities to make sure parents can be aware of what's going on in the classroom that uh, teachers are, are available to meet with the parents uh, if there's difficulty going on. And the other thing that I've been a really big proponent of is, you know, some kids just are not going to have uh, the ability of a parent to be sort of that mentor and that guiding force in their education for whatever circumstances. So mentoring programs where you get volunteers that will come in and, and partner with a student and really be their advocate and the person who's keeping track help of how they're doing in school and helping them work through challenges can be a tremendous benefit. I, I mentor in the school district we're in. Um, we've got a great program. Uh, it started for juniors and seniors, and, and most of the kids in that program have, are from families where their, their parents have never gone on to college, and many of them did, did not graduate from high school. So we pay special attention to pairing up mentors with those kids that have got great potential, but they need that help. Uh, we're now expanding that down to junior high. And so I think uh, you can never underestimate just the power of one caring adult in a kid's life that can make a huge difference in their educational success. And I know that we have a school district in this state, and it might be more than one, where every staff member is assigned to a child or chooses a child, and they follow them through the entire year. And they greet them in the morning or whenever they can. They address their homework. They address any situations that they might be having that may bring a frown to the face or something like that. And you know, that connection of every staff member, yeah. that includes custodians and cooks and everyone else. And that's great. And the other thing I wanted to say is technology has move to the point where parents, at least if they have technology at home, have, have a access to broadband, et cetera, Wi-Fi, they have a constant connection with the school. And I think the schools are really trying to make that a very viable way to connect with parents. And then we have the libraries, and we have people at the libraries. Uh, St. Paul, I think, has tried uh, very hard to make sure their students are connected through a directory with the St. Paul school system, or the St. Paul public library system through the school system. So there are ways, but it takes energy, it takes time, and it takes effort. 
Well, Representative Loon touched on it a little while ago, and that was the idea of poverty. When you look at student success, nothing correlates as well, not race or any other factor correlates as well to a student success as poverty. And what we find is that we have generational poverty. Parents don't know how to advocate for their kids. They don't know how to make education a priority yeah. because it was never made a priority for them. And there are programs, pi private, public, uh, partnerships going on that are doing some of that work and we're starting to see some successes come out of that. I'd like to see more of that. We need to start challenging our cities. Um, Mayor Fry, you know, let's let's start lifting people out of poverty. Huh. And, yeah. and because I, I grew up, quite honestly, I grew up for a short period of time in subsidized housing. You know, my family was not wealthy, but my, my parents worked hard to get out of that. It seems like today we get these people uh, uh, into the government programs and there's no way out. As soon as they start to make any sort of progress, any sort of success, we kind of just throw them to the wolves. And so we've got to, there, there's probably some welfare reform that goes in there that ties into education, but really helping parents be advocates for their kids and understanding how important this education is, I think will help us go a long way. Uh, Senator uh, Dreheim, is there anything in, in terms of in your community being more rural when it when it comes to family involvement, um, does is what they're saying does it echo for for what's for what takes place in your community? How do um, you know what what challenges do you guys face in that regard in terms of parental involvement? You know the the, uh, the town that my kids go to school. We we live outside of town, but uh, um, you know very uh, high number of free and reduced lunch students, yeah. um, a lot of single parents. And I think that's something we get lost in is the family unit. You know, we can debate what that is all day long, but having two parents in a household um, makes a huge difference. And, and, and I, you know, I see a lot of kids that maybe struggle a little bit and uh, not because of their one parent that's at their house, but, it, but it's a lot of work especially when the kids get like our age, I think our kids are close in age. Sure. Um, you know, they, they need a little more um, supervision on, on homework. And, you know, they're starting to do real homework and, and very complicated homework that, that they'll get lost in if they don't keep up. And if you're a single mom or a single dad working, trying to keep up the house, it, it, it's hard to spend time on, on the kids. Well, and let's, uh, let, let, let's wrap up on this, and, and feel free to comment if you want, because I don't think we solved the problem of public education today, but we got a little bit closer. No, but it is, it, there are so many variables involved, you know, and so many little issues that have to be dealt with on top of the big issues. And, and you know, when we talk about when education gets talked about, it's usually when something major happens. But there's so many small things that can be done. It's like tackling one problem at a time. And I'll use a quick anecdotal story, and we'll go here, and then we'll wrap things up. My 11-year-old, uh, fantastic, obviously, greatest kid in the world, apart from my 16-year-old, because they're mine. Um, but he dealt with something that I didn't anticipate that he was going to have to deal with, and that was bullying. I never in a million years, my, you know, it just, I, I don't, I guess maybe, maybe some parents because of the nature of their kids might go, well, he's more prone to, to bullying. Maybe I just didn't, I didn't expect that to be the, to be the case. And he had to deal with it. And we had to go and consult with teachers and the principal. And it's funny because, you know, my, my wife being so involved it, it, as she is in the process, you know, she wants to slay the dragons. You know, and and I and, and it's a good balance between the two of us. But as we're dealing with this problem and I want to deal with this issue too, I also know the amount of time that we now have to take from the principal to deal with this singular issue, from his teacher to deal with this singular issue. Now it's what they signed up for. It's important, it needs to be dealt with, but be that as it may, I mean we're talking hours you know, hours that have to be spent on this particular situation. And yet, my son went to, he's going into middle school. We did a tour of, of the school for the first time yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. And I thought that he was doing fine. And suddenly now, as we're walking the halls, he's making decisions based off of how he can avoid being bullied. 
You know, I think I may sit here in the, in the, in the lunchroom because if something were to happen, I can get out the door quickly. And I was completely, you know, uh, uh, unaware of this, right? And it really, and I'll, I'll be honest, it opened my eyes. You know, as a talk show host, a lot of times until you go through it, you don't really understand. And, and, and you have to, I don't know if you guys know this, as talk show hosts, we have to generalize a lot. Simplify it, right? But I suddenly realized, I go, wow, this is, this is, a, this is a much bigger issue, deeper issue than even I expected. I only mention all that because each of those circumstances need to be dealt with on an individual basis, like so many of the other problems that we deal with in the school on an individual basis. You know? And if we're not electing the leadership in the school boards to make the right decisions, we're already a step behind. If we're not making the right decisions in the legislature, we're, we're, we're putting us further, further behind. I hope it's an issue that continues to be discussed in ways like this. Right? Because we can't, like, this conversation can't really happen in this magnitude on the radio. Because I want to keep my job. <laughs> and while it's really fascinating for me to be able to occupy your, your time and knowing that you guys are in a position where you, can, where you can do something about it, these conversations just don't happen enough to enact that kind of change. So it's not really a question. It's just a general statement. So... I guess I'll allow each of you to sort of make your own sort of closing comments as we wrap this, uh, th this conversation up about, about education and, and maybe what everybody can do who's watching here or, or, or watching on video later, what they can do, what's maybe a small thing they can do to, uh, to help with their own schools. Yeah, I think it goes back to, like we discussed earlier, being involved and, and paying attention, uh, not only to uh, your kids, but the classroom and what's happening in the classroom with all the kids in your student's uh, class or grade, depending on the size of school. Um, you know, what uh, the distractions in a small group like that, and, and especially in my area where uh, my daughter's class is the biggest in the school at 50. Um, so relatively small classes. Um, so, you know, when, when there's an issue with one kid, it affects the whole grade. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the problem you illustrate, I think, is um, a couple of points I'll just make. One is that, you know, as we've talked about some of the things that affect children and their education, a lot of times a comment is made, well, we're, we're expecting schools to do so much. Right. And we are. I mean, it really is a big job. But on the other hand, um, it's kind of hard not to put some uh, expectations on the schools because kids spend six to eight hours every day there. Yeah. Um, it's a responsibility. It is a big responsibility. And so, you know, I think I, I've toured a lot of schools, and I think most schools are very aware of trying to cultivate an, an, uh, uh, an atmosphere and a, a, an expectation of students that um, there's a, a standard of behavior. We expect you to treat all of the people you go to, to school with, the students and the teachers and the staff, respectfully. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences for behavior that's, that's it, our, our school is called above the line and below the line behavior. So if your behavior is below the line, you're going to have a, a consequence. And, and I think those things are important. But, you know, gosh, when I think about when I was in school compared to my kids and now, and my kids are in their early 20s, what's happening now, I think some things in our society make it even tougher. With the advent of social media, <laughs> how many of our kids have a phone or are plugged into that and the bullying that can go on online when parents may not even be aware of it. Yeah. I mean, this is very challenging times for adults. And again, it just, we all need to reinforce you. You need to know what's going on. If your kids have a, a, a cell phone or access to social media, you need to know what's going on there because there's some very inappropriate things. And then it ends up a lot of times coming to the school to help solve yeah. those problems. So, um, I think uh, adults also need to model very uh, respectful behavior if we're asking that of our kids. Wait, there's garbage on the internet? <laughs> I thought it was, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Please. Well, and Representative Loon touched on what I wanted to talk about, and that is, you know, so we talked about bullying when I was on the school board, and a lot of it happens outside of the school day. And the first thing that parents will say is, well, what's the school gonna do about it? You know, back in my day, if I had a problem or if I, if I treated somebody else badly, their mom called my mom. Right. That doesn't happen anymore. And, and so what happens? Either they go to the school and they complain 
uh, or they post something out on Twitter and it creates a firestorm, right? Um, we've just got to get back to the point where we have a, a mutual respect for each other. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, the sad transition in society that we've had. Um, parents need to talk to parents. We know each other from the, from the sports teams and from the plays and from the dance studio. And I mean, our kids are, are so, uh, so overly scheduled at this point. Um, but they know, you know parents, and, and my gosh, it, step up and, and make, make a, a, an effort. But then also as a parent, you know, sometimes I know it's, it's easy to get defensive, but I always, you know, I always won. I always believed the teacher when a, when a complaint came. Right. Um, and my kids knew that. <laughs> if this comes back, I'm believing her over you. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is, you know, I always, if, if something did come back to me from another parent, I always took it seriously. And I would hope that other parents would do that. And I think that's, I think that's where we start to address this. It goes back to that family and, and our sense of community. And as we've as we've taken our schools and we've put more and more on them, we're asking them to be social workers, we're asking them to be mental health professionals, we're asking them to do these incredible things. No wonder they don't have time or feel overburdened for some of the, for some of the most basic tasks because we're asking them to go above and beyond what their role should be. Mm -hmm. and, and I blame the school district somewhat because again, uh, they will willingly take this on because they want to see a solution, but sometimes uh, when somebody comes to me and says, Senator Pratt, I've got this problem, what's the state going to do about it? I said, well, I could pass a law, but it's not the right thing to do. There's what I can do and what I should do. And this should be done here between you two. Well, I know this is, uh, you know, pie in the sky may be my thought, but parents have to teach their children uh, how to build their character. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, you model that and you, uh, you provide opportunities for them. Certainly, uh, you know, the church is an important place or your faith, uh, but also the extension of that in our school districts. Character education is something that we have been uh, kind of moving through state law in not a mandated way, but a encouraged way for 20 years. It started with Mark Olson back in, I think, 1999-2000. Mm -hmm. He was promoting character education. I, I started to do that. I know Representative Loon has done that. And we've done that through our education bills, trying in some way to promote character education. Because, you know, when, when children hear uh, respect, as Representative Loon was noting, that, you know, the, there's a banner in the school, because like her, I visited a lot of schools, there's a banner about respect, responsibility. If you just master those two character traits and embed them in yourself, you're going to, to follow through with that, and parents have to recognize that as well. Well, Representative Erickson, Representative Loon, uh, Senator uh, Dr uh, Dreheim, and Senator Pratt, thank you so much for taking some time out this morning, and thank you for what you're doing. Uh, we, can, we, cannot, uh, we, we can't thank you enough that you guys are out there fighting the, the good fight and doing the, uh, doing the Lord's work. Uh, I'm John Justice from uh, Twin Cities News Talk, Justice and Drew. Um, if you are at the fair for any portion of the rest of the weekend, we'll be back here uh, tomorrow at 2 for a, uh, a panel on the, uh, on the Constitution, the Constitutional Candidates. Oh. And then on Sunday at 2 o'clock, your, uh, your next governor, uh, Jeff Johnson, will be here up on stage oh. with us as well. And Drew will be with me uh, as well. Make sure you guys buy a lot of gear, right? Because it's cool to be a conservative. It's punk to support Trump. I'm rolling with him. I'm going to make a t-shirt, right? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I really do appreciate it. It was great. Enjoy the rest of your uh, fantastic day here.